Good afternoon. Hey, so um, again, I apologize and thank you very much for uh, waiting about 10 minutes. Uh, I, this is the official straddle that I've decided for in terms of the time making folks wait, but also waiting for a few folks that are coming from the, the keynote late. So hopefully we'll get everybody here. Um, just by way of introduction, um, my name is Jason Waxman, and I run the Cloud Platforms Group at Intel. And we're responsible for the products and the technologies that uh, hopefully power Amazon and, and other cloud service providers around the world. Um, we see a lot of changes occurring on the horizon, and one of the questions that I get asked, and I get asked a lot by users such as yourselves or technology providers, is how do I know what kind of infrastructure I need? Are there best practices out there to help me deploy what I'm doing in the cloud more efficiently? And the whole purpose of the talk today is really around case studies. I mean, there's no magic formula. Um, if you are a user of cloud services, it's going to be dependent upon your application and what you do as to what you need. But what I thought we would do is put together as many interesting case studies and examples as we could just by frame of reference and, and hopefully uh, glean some learnings from it about how to make your cloud services more agile, more cost effective, and, and more secure, which are the three things that we've been hearing from folks that they want to go see. The other thing which I'll highlight is that um, we at Intel, we're not just the chip providers, but we also use cloud services, and we also have and provide cloud services, and so some of the examples that you'll see will be based off of what we're doing at Intel. So uh, what I'll do is I'll start off by setting a little bit of the foundation of what are the trends driving us in a certain direction. I'll talk about what are some of the factors that we see as driving best practices, and then the vast majority of what we'll be doing, including some uh, esteemed guests that we have here today, we'll be talking about some of the case studies and how we use Amazon Web Services in, uh, to go drive our applications as efficiently as we possibly can. And then, um, since it's an Intel presentation at the end, I want to talk a little geeky about uh, some of the technology and the futures, uh, maybe what I'd call the sausage making. You know, what's some of the stuff that you might never see, but it's kind of on the horizon and is going to help to make the next generation of cloud services even better. So anyway, that's what I've got in store for today. And assuming the PC keeps up, because we've got some really cool videos in here, uh, we should have a good time for the next hour or so. All right, so I'm just going to build this out real quickly. Um, I want to start with a bit of the foundation, or if you will, the, the problem statement. And a, a number of you, hopefully in the room here, are folks that are developing using Amazon Web Services, and you're thinking about your current application and how it's going to scale. Some of you are big companies, some of you may be startups, and you're thinking, you know, hopefully with whatever success I'm going to have in the application I'm deploying, I need to make sure that it's scalable and it meets the needs. And what I'm about to tell you is that what you're developing in one form or another is only going to get harder. Uh, and the reason is, is due to some of these drivers. The first is really that we have not yet seen the full impact of perceptual computing on your applications. I think things such as uh, swipe are great. I think that the early stages of voice are showing where we're going. But we think that gesture, that we think that voice and much more natural means of communicating with devices are going to become the way of things moving forward. And that means that unless we can find a way of getting individual devices intelligent enough, and believe me, at Intel we'd love to make that happen, you're going to need and rely much more on cloud-based services and platform as a service to go drive some of those APIs. And so just as a, an example, we think over the next several years that you're going to see a 20x increase in the amount of demand in voice and other natural type of gesture recognition through phones. And that's going to drive up bandwidth. It's going to drive up tremendous amount of, of capacity that you're going to need in your cloud services. The, uh, the other one is the, driven by the pervasiveness of devices themselves. And of course, we all have phones, smartphones. Some of us have multiple phones. How many people have multiple phones on them today? Right, a few of you. Um, but we also are going to see just many more devices. You've got your PC, you've got your tablets, you've got your phones. But we also see what we call this Internet of Things emerging where the devices around us are going to have more intelligence. And it won't just necessarily be us. It will actually also be the factory automation, the shipping trucks. Uh, it will be wearables. Um, one of the projects that we're involved in right now deals with Parkinson's research and how you can put patients in, um, with wearables to really look and track and monitor the progression of the disease. And, add intelligence to this. So but all these devices are going to consume more traffic. 
All of those devices are going to be things that you are going to want to connect in one form or another in your services. And you know, when we just think about media alone as one small instance of what people are going to need to see across those devices, we expect to see a 4x increase in the number of servers that are going to be required to drive the media um, transcoding uh, for the future, and we expect to see a 16x increase in the amount of mobile video traffic. So that's just one example of something that's already what you would call pretty mature. But more and more devices, in fact, we expect that by 2020, there'll be 20 billion connected devices. Only a fraction of them will be the PCs and things that we have and mobile phones. Um, and then on top of it, there's going to be more personalization. Uh, the desire to really do uh, you know, what many people are calling big data or, or big insights. How do you go ahead and take the stream from the Internet of Things, combine it with some of the work that you might be doing in a, a Twitter feeds? We have some really interesting projects going around the world all around how do we make people's lives better. And the way we make people's lives better is helping them connect all those devices and helping them to find insights. And just to go back to the healthcare example for a minute, you know, some of you are in the room and who are involved in that kind of field. In fact, one of my, my uh, uh, co-speakers will be uh, talking about uh, what they do in the pharma research area. But when you think about healthcare and the idea of how many, how many we can make our lives better by combining insights about how we live, our genome, right, behavioral things, drug trials, bringing all of that together, making our lives more personal is going to drive a tremendous amount of overhead on top of this. So these are the things that as difficult as it is to get the simple software or services that you are trying to get to scale already today is going to get a heck of a lot more complex over the next five years to go deliver the type of experience that you're really going to want to go deliver. And so the good news is, is that when you deliver this experience, when you have this new application that has voice recognition and it, makes, it, it delivers a personal assistant and whatever field that you're in delivers that better experience, people are going to tell nine people on average about how great your service is and it's going to help ramp whatever business you're in, again, whether a big company or a small company. The downside of that is, is that if you fail and you have a really crappy experience, they tell even more people um, about it. And you've seen these statistics before. They're not mine. But you know, just to give you a couple other words, uh, CompuWare, as an example, has highlighted the fact that if on a page a user waits more than six seconds, they're on to some other site. They leave your site. They've highlighted the fact that when people leave and break a relationship with the company, 71% of the time, it's because of a bad experience. And in fact, they also did another survey that said uh, to a lot of folks here in the room, users like yourselves, how much would you have estimated uh, to have lost due to some failure in cloud services, either your own or somebody else's? And of the 378 respondents in this survey, all of them said over a million dollars they'd estimated they had lost due to some sort of opportunity or impact due to a failure in their services. So we have to get this right, and that, asks, that raises the question, what is it that's required? Um, and I can tell you that you know, and that's really the basis of what we are going to try and highlight today. What can we do to have some of the fundamentals in place to get our services to scale better? What are other companies doing? What's going to make it happen? As an underlying you know, uh, impact, when you look at the growth rates to go drive those types of experiences, the amount of mobile traffic is going to increase 8x over the next five years, just as an example. So we're going to need more bandwidth. We're going to need better latency. And this is really where cloud computing comes in. And, and having a partner like Amazon Web Services, where you have a global presence around the world, and you can take advantage of that to go deliver your services with low latency. So, there are three fundamental aspects that we think are required in delivering the experiences. The first one is agility. And by the way, for each of these aspects, there's a developer view as well as a consumer view to it. So agility being, from a developer standpoint, I need to be able to scale. right? I need to be able to respond to whatever my consumer wants. The consumer, on the other hand, says, I want the information that I want immediately. Right? I don't really care how many people are using your system. I care about my experience. I want it customized to me. And the better job you can do it, the more likely I am to have an affinity to your business. The second element of it is, while well, on one hand, you are all responsible for and the keeper of your company's user experience, the flip side is you can't do it at any cost. None of us have an unlimited uh, blank check, uh, not even my TA. Oh, who's here in the room today? You know, we all have budgets that we have to go contend with. And um, 
in doing that, you have to think about the efficiency. And so you want to be able to have it scalable, but how do you make sure that what the resources you're using are done so the most effectively? And that translates also into the consumer that they're not paying more for the service or whatever it is you're delivering than they have to as well. And then the last aspect of it, but certainly not least, is the reliability of it. And reliability in some cases is heavily correlated to security from the standpoint of the user. They want to know, um, and this is obviously in the forefront of all of our minds as we think about cloud services, we are entrusted with their data in some cases. How do we make sure that we're able to deliver on that promise? So the, the fundamental aspects that we want to deliver on are how do we make these services, while they're becoming more complex, agile, efficient, and reliable. And so if you think about them then as the, the top goals, again, the agile, efficient, and reliable at the top, what do we need to do as sort of the infrastructure people to deliver that service to make it happen? And this will become sort of the, the framing of the rest of the presentation here. The agility comes down to scale. How do I get an infrastructure that can scale rapidly? And we'll kind of share a couple of best practices on how we're doing it and how we take advantage of Amazon to help us support that scale. The second is efficiency. And this was sort of the, the title of the talk around choosing the right instance. Um, there's definitely a little bit of art involved here. But again, we can learn from how other people are doing it. I'll share what Intel is doing. And we'll have uh, some other examples as well. Um, and we'll talk about the fact that there's a good reason that there are more and more EC2 instances coming out every day is because you, as the user, are demanding more optimization and more efficiency for your workload. And then we'll talk last about reliability. And I'll zero in here mostly around security. There's obviously a lot of aspects of reliability and redundancy and fault tolerance and building your application to scale. Um, there's only so much we could kind of pack into the hour, but uh, we'll focus in on kind of security as that aspect of it. Okay, so these are the three key things that we want to go drive. I'll start a little bit with agility. Um, and as I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, Intel is a user of uh, cloud services, and we use uh, Amazon Web Services in two specific areas. And in fact, we use in a number of other areas. Um, aside from our own IT department, which will use Amazon for certain types of applications, we have two big applications within uh, Intel. The first is a company that we recently acquired called Mashery, which does uh, API management services. And I'll go into them in just a little bit. Um, but I'll also highlight an example in a little bit around Intel's cloud services platform. Uh, we do context services, content services, shopping services. Think of it again, you know, from an Intel perspective, we tend to do ingredients rather than trying to provide a solution. But both of these cloud services are running on um, Amazon Web Services, and we'll talk about some of the learnings that we've had. So first, I want to start with a little bit about Mashery. And in each of these uh, uh, examples, we'll talk a little bit about the company so you have some context about what they do and their size and scale. And then we'll talk about some of the learnings here. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, Mastery is a company that does API management services. And they do it for a wide range of, of uh, enterprise customers. You can see ESPN, Walmart, Expedia, Best Buy, Comcast, all customers of Mashery because they've had a demonstrated ability to make it very simple to be able to allow companies to manage their APIs as a product. And so today, um, still relatively new acquisition, already 175 customers, 60,000 applications, 215,000 developers, and about half a billion API calls a day. Now that's not yet in the, the API billionaires club like uh, Twitter or, or Facebook, but it's, a, it's getting pretty close and, and the, the growth is, is um, moving pretty fast. So that's a little bit of a context about the, the business. And when you've got this kind of uh, enterprise class set of requirements, and the customers expect things to scale, how do you um, get it to scale? So one of the things that's a challenge for Mashery is the, uh, the level of scale, sort of the peaks and valleys, if you will, of the business. And there are definitely a number of times where there is a 100x increase over a short period of time for the demands for one of their APIs. And so as an example, some of those are predictable. When the Olympics came and you think about some of the companies that, that Mashery uh, services that are in the sports arena space, you can predict that there's going to be a big amount of demand. You can go take proactive action for it. But then there are some that are unpredictable. 
Um, I don't know that I would have guessed this, but apparently Whitney Houston's death in 2012 created for one of their sites a 100x increase in traffic. So you've got the predictable peaks, but then you also have the unpredictable peaks. And the question is, how do you come up with some best practices to make sure that you things can scale? Well, the first one is about planning. They have a, an extensive and robust QA environment, and they do a lot of load tests and, and in the proof of concept. So there are a number of instances, about 200 instances that they have that are constantly mirroring what their production sites are doing. And those tend to be spot instances um, or on-demand instances, um, but they tend to be things that we ramp up and down to kind of continue to look at the, the load testing and make sure that the APIs and the applications can scale and we're, pre we're ready for the unpredictable. The second thing is making the application modular. So what they do is they try not to have too many applications in, a, in an instance. So as an example, you've got an application tier that tends to use C1s. They're either C1 mediums or extra larges, depending upon the type of application. And there's probably about um, 150 to 400 of those at any, any given point in time. There's a core amount of them that are reserved instances, but a lot of them tend to be um, on demand, not so much spot, because they tend to be needed when they're needed. Um, but then you've got uh, caching, where the caching will tend to be reserved instances around the world. There tend to be an M1 large type of uh, instance to be, provide stability and provide that low latency support um, around the world. But by having, for example, the application tier separated from the caching tier, separated from the database tier, they're able to scale and adapt their applications and their APIs to what the customers demand. So as an example, if a new sports uh, 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 application comes out and they need to be able to provide real-time sports scores, they're gonna have a lot of call hits and that means that they're gonna wanna go scale the application tier, but they don't necessarily have to scale the caching tier. Whereas, for example, a new map type of service, they might need to scale the caching tier dramatically and not so much the application tier. But having that modularity in each of the instances being for the specific component of the application allows them that flexibility in the architecture. And then last is global distribution. Um, pretty much every global instance of AWS, Mastery has a full stack running there. And in fact, when a new one comes online, they pride themselves within hours about being up and ready with a full stack to take advantage of it. Their customers are global. They need to be able to react on a real-time basis and with very low latency. And so they take advantage of the global scale that very few companies have, um, with the exception of Amazon and a few others, to make sure that they can take advantage of that, have a database tier and a caching tier in each of those regions. And they've been able to get to the point where for most of their APIs, the back-end transactions are within a few milliseconds in general. So good scale, and that's how they're doing it. But that's just one example. I wanted to invite um, you know, Kevin Bailey, from, who's the CEO from Atomic Fiction, and I gave you sort of that teaser on cool videos. So when you think about um, you know, movies and, and the idea of rendering things, and there are these big peaks, and you need to have that kind of massive scale, you know, the work that Kevin's doing really came to mind. So I want to invite him up. Please welcome him, if you would, um, to talk about the work that he's doing. Thank you very much for that awesome intro. Um, so my company, Atomic Fiction, is uh, a company that does visual effects for film and television. Uh, we've worked on some pretty big movies over the last three years that the company has been in existence. We have a lot of fun doing the work that we do. We specialize in digital environment work and also digital characters. So we sometimes make environments, just worlds at, from scratch. And also we'll do things like if a character, an actor needs a, like a damage on their face or missing a limb, something that can't be done with makeup, or we actually just need to swap out an actor for another actor if that actor can't show up on a day to shoot, things like that, we'll do those kinds of things as well, so digital character work. We're known for kind of medium volume, very high-end work, and we, our tagline is kind of that we have a big company infrastructure and a small company vibe. We've had experience at a lot of the biggest companies in the industry before we started Atomic Fiction, and we decided right off the bat that we wanted to take the best thing from those big companies and implement it with kind of a small mom, pa, shop vibe. So we decided right off the bat to use AWS for all of our heavy lifting computing. We have a very data or data crunching intensive process called rendering, which is basically taking a 
uh, recipe, if you will, wireframes and textures and virtual lights and cameras, and baking that down into this final beautiful image that you see on the screen. And that process can take 10 minutes, and sometimes it can take 24 to 40 to 60 hours for every frame of the film, and there's 24 frames in every second. So it can take an immense amount of time. We need a lot of processing power, and AWS affords us the ability to scale up to the level we need for every sort of level that I just mentioned of frame times. And for anybody that saw me talk during the keynote presentation yesterday, you know how much I love these people. These people are by far the most important people in the entire process. They're the most important thing. Com computing is really important. Giving these artists the tools that they need to do the job that they need to do, and, and they, they're the ones that come up with these worlds out of like nothing, the ether. They, they create this stuff out of their imagination. So giving them the tools that they use at the scale they need is incredibly important to us. So over the last three years, we've worked on some pretty cool movies. These are just a few of them. I'm going to show you a quick little reel uh, that gives you a sampling of the kind of work that we do. Oh, wait. Should be the next one. There we go. Sorry, it's a little stuttery. So obviously we have a crap load of fun doing this kind of work. I mean, it is really a good time. Um, and through the use of AWS, we're actually allowed to scale from, sometimes we have zero machines, we just have the iMac that's sitting on an artist's desk, and then the next moment we can have 400, 500, 1,000 instances spun up and running in AWS, crunching numbers, helping us hit our deadlines, and then at the end of that, we can go back down to zero. So scaling up is really important to be able to hit the creative demands of the director, scaling back down is just as important because it allows us to stay healthy as a business between those peaks. And it also means that when a director comes to us and says, hey, I, you know, I want to make sure that I'm spending money efficiently, I'm getting at the best bang for the buck, you know, I can very honestly look them in the eye and say, yeah, every dollar you spend with us, you're going to see up on, the screen, up on the big screen. That's a very important promise for us to be able to keep. Also, the other thing that AWS allows us to do is it allows us to get artists faster turnaround for the same price. If you think about it, we have 100 instances for one hour versus 10 instances for 10 hours. It's the same dollar amount. Just one of those ways gets the artist back their result 10 times faster. So for artists to be able to get the result while the idea is still fresh in their head is so important. So unlimiting creativity, what we like to call unlimiting creativity, is sort of freeing the creative so directors can achieve their visions without worrying about our physical capacity, our limitations. Artists also, getting stuff back faster and having the resources that they need to hit the look is really important. And AWS, because we can actually very accurately capture our costs for rendering and pass them along to our clients directly, offers increased transparency to our clients, and it means that we're not going to bankrupt the company by sort of this unlimiting of the creativity. Choosing instances, as Jason mentioned, is a little bit of an art form. Um, we've settled into currently two different instance types. The C1X large is great for just you know, very low uh, you know, demand computing tasks. And then we use the CC2 8X large. Uh, it actually has a remarkably good dollar per compute unit value, and its beefy RAM means that we can han it can handle some of these 25, 30 hour frames uh, as those compute tasks. And we have a partner that we work with called Zinc that handles all the instance management and data transfer. And it actually makes the implementation with these instance types plug and play and makes the process really transparent uh, to our artists. 
So Star Trek Into Darkness was one of my favorite movies that we've used AWS on. I'm just going to give you a quick example of that. Uh, this is a location that uh, we filmed in for Into Darkness. It was a Budweiser factory, but J.J. Abrams didn't want it to look like a beer factory. He wanted it to look like the engine room on the Starship Enterprise. So we started with all these reference photography, and there is like so much shiny metal, which is really slow to render, and tons of geometry, all these pipes, which adds to it. This is what we had to start from, so we had to build the entire world. But instead of being worried about an artist coming up with a frame like this, you know, making it slow, like crushing the company under the weight of the processing, we just set him free and said, do whatever you want. And he came up with that image, which we used then to create uh, some pretty cool shots that, uh, that show off all this shiny metal and, and really give the vibe of this, uh, they give the vibe of this whole environment in a way that is uh, pretty compelling, I think. Um, so we're, we're really super excited to be able to achieve JJ's vision, um, but also not crush the company uh, under the weight of the computing demands of these scenes. That shot took 25 hours of frame to render. So for Star Trek Into Darkness, we were able to achieve exactly what JJ wanted. For 80% of the tasks, the C2, uh, CC2 8X Large was totally the right fit for the job. And you know we were able to burst and grow. We grew 200% month over month, two months in a row, in order to achieve what he wanted to. And at the end, we went back down to zero. So it was a real success story in both our ability to grow and go down. So our ideal instance moving forward, we're actually really freaking excited uh, by the announcement of the, uh, the uh, new Xeon processor that's, that, that was announced today, the E5 V2 processor. I think it was yesterday it was announced, yeah. right? And also the C3 uh, instance types on AWS because they are high compute and they have just enough memory for what we need. And the, one of the reasons we're so excited about it is because those instances will actually allow us to move even more of our process up into the cloud and serve for the demands of artists as well. Um, those combined with the G2 instances and all those sort of GPU uh, action that's going on, it's a really exciting new world for us in the computer graphics industry and being able to use more cloud to do more things and scale way bigger than we ever have in the past. So thanks a ton for inviting me up here on stage to tell the story and uh, yeah. Thank looking, you much, sir. Good lo seeing you. Looking forward to your guys' next stop. That was a great example of uh, scale, right? Think about just the massive amounts of compute power and then it goes away. Although I actually have to say I'm kind of disappointed that you didn't have to build those robots because that would be pretty cool if you didn't just have to, if you could uh, make, have, have those be real. All right, so um, we talked about the scalability and we gave a couple of examples on best practices and how people are using it and why it's important. Uh, let's turn our, our uh, attention to efficiency. Now a little backstory here before I get in. I remember being, I think maybe at this conference or it was another cloud conference a couple years ago can't remember, they all start to blur together after a while, right? Um, and, and I had an argument, someone said, you know, cloud's always gonna be homogenous, right? That's what clouds are. They're just a lot of compute and they all need to be the same because that's the way it is and that's what a cloud will be. And I, at the time, had said, hey, look, you can't have homogenous clouds, they're just not gonna be competitive. The, the reality is, is that you as an audience, the reason you use a cloud is that in general, you've got an application that needs to scale. Anybody here just use one instance in, you know, maybe you do. Um, I shouldn't ask that question. But in general, you're, you're doing this because you have an application that needs to scale. That application needs to scale, it means it needs to do so efficiently. There's got to be some level of cost effectiveness to it. And so here's the result, the, you know, five years later from that debate. I remember, you know, when there were a couple of instances in Amazon. And now, and this isn't even showing all of them, I think there are 17 instances that uh, Amazon offers. And they're gonna continue to keep offering more. We'll talk about them a little bit later. Oops, sorry, I didn't, I realized there was, didn't realize there was a build. Now hopefully it makes sense. There's a big range of applications, that's the first part. But now look at all the different places where you know, Amazon is covering the map. And, and there are a couple of observations here. I think the first is that there is definitely a recognition that each of your applications is unique and different. You may even be doing the same function. You may be doing a search algorithm, but your algorithm may be different different and may use different amounts of compute, network, and storage. And as a result, if you're going to do it efficiently at scale, you need an infrastructure or an instance or a cloud service that's tailored to your application. Otherwise, you're just wasting a bunch of, of cost and wasting a bunch of power and wasting a bunch of, of overhead at the end of the day. And that's the reason that Amazon's um, covering the map. Now, the other thing that I'll highlight here is that it is pretty rare 
that you find a cloud service provider that can cover this type of range, and that comes from having scale. Because it is difficult to have what I'd call a heterogeneous cloud, to have that many different um, instances at the end of the day. You'll note that we've kind of mapped on top of this some of the Xeon CPUs that go into those instances, and in a lot of cases, they're different because you may want more frequency, or you may need a bigger cache size, or you may want to support more memory. And we've tried to tailor the infrastructure that we work with the OEMs to deliver to, to Amazon to make that happen. But being able to manage that level of complexity, I mean, think about it like a, a, a Tetris problem. You're ordering machines, and Amazon behind the scene is trying to figure out how to go land the right equipment at the right place so that they get the right kind of capacity for what you're looking to go do. And they can do it through the law of averages, because if you look at, a, at this room and how many people are at this conference, there's a huge customer base to go make that happen. It's very difficult to get that kind of scale. So they've done a very good job, instant, job of doing it, but it does say that optimization is important and there is a clear recognition that each of your applications needs to find the right home. So the question then becomes, okay, well, now with all this complexity, what is the right home and how do I, I leverage some of the best practices in the industry to go make it happen? So I'll start by talking about the other portion of the Intel Cloud Services um, uh, a piece. So, we have a cloud services platform, and right now we've got um, 175,000 beta users. Um, the entire path to production for these services is in AWS. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, these are content and context uh, services. They're kind of ingredients that will allow somebody to produce an e-commerce application and leverage some of the, the things that Intel has done. Um, we've got about uh, 1,500 instances right now that we have, and there's obviously a, a, a mixture of different things. Now, because we've been ramping this so rapidly and there's been so much interest in people leveraging the services, um, it's very easy to let things get away from you. And so we woke up one moment and we looked at the cost in, in, in August, and I'll show you the comparison in just a second, and realized, holy cow, we spent $300,000. And again, Intel, we've got a pretty big cash reserve, but you still spend $300,000 uh, a month, someone's gonna look at it and go, okay, what are, you, what are you doing and are you using these things effectively and efficiently? And I think that the, the team looked at it and said, you know, there are some things that we need to do. There's a lot of instances that get spun up to go do things and then we lost track of them, we're not managing them. Or we really figured out whether we're putting the right types of applications and the right types of things. And what we looked at it, most of the instances were never going over 10% utilization. So what did we do? What we did is we started off by, by using Trusted Advisor. And, and by the way, Trusted Advisor is a very good tool. There are other tools out there. Uh, Cloudability, for example, has a, a detailed paid service offering that also offers some sort of analytics. Um, that allows you to really look into the usage and the characterization of your VMs. But what you see here in this chart is the blue was our August expenditures, the orange were our October expenditures. And, and what we did is through using Trusted Advisor, we realized that a lot of our content and context services, the applications themselves, were using M1 extra larges. And who doesn't like an extra large, right? You go to the... the the fast food place, and you're always going to order the, the big gulp, right? I mean, it's just 29 cents more. Um, well, guess what? Those things are, they add up to the $300,000 bill, and you start adding those things up uh, a lot. So we had too many venties, and we didn't need it. But we also, part of the reason we were doing that was we were just spinning up a lot of the same instance, and we actually needed it for some other types of things that were being constrained. And so, for example, our MySQL database was being IOPS constrained, and we were seeing failures on it. And we recognized that we needed you know, bigger uh, memory instances and a bigger IOPS allocation. So by going through and using the types of tools like Trusted Advisor, we could really reconcile what the usage was. The other thing which we realized is that some of the things that weren't production usages, when people kind of went home at the end of the day, and maybe they didn't really need them for test and development, and we could kind of shut those sorts of things off. Um, and then the other element, too, is at some point you get confident enough in your core business that it's growing, you can buy more reserved instances, which obviously save money. So it was really kind of the combination of those things. We basically took that $300,000 bill and cut it by 64% at the end of the day. So again, that was kind of our experience, but I always like to be able to, to, to share other examples. So I wanted to invite Stephen Litster from uh, Novartis to come up and share his. So we saw two really cool examples today of, of cloud. We had the, the super cool rendering of machines, and now we're going to figure out how we uh, make people's lives better. So Stephen, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you. <laughs> uh.
as a geek, I was dreading actually following your talk. Well, I'll give it a shot. So, um, a movie, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've got a small movie. We need some more effects on it. Um, so Jason mentioned, so I work for the, um, the Vast Institutes for Biomedical Research. You'll hear me refer to it as NIBA. Um, so I want to briefly present, um, give you a quick overview of how we're using AWS and scalable infrastructure to really accelerate science or scientific discovery in the workplace. So NIBA is the research wing of the much larger Novartis Pharmaceutical Company. And my group's role is in the design and operation of the high performance and distributed computing environments in support of scientific disciplines such as next generation sequencing, imaging, and a variety of modeling and simulation techniques, one of which known as virtual screening, that I'm gonna briefly talk about today. If hopefully this works. So virtual screening is a computational technique used in drug discovery, whereby you search libraries of small molecules to see which may bind to, the, to a, a target, typically a protein receptor or enzyme. Um, you see, this, and that's what's going on with the video right here. So you can think of it as a, as a lock and key model. So the target or the protein is the lock, and the small molecules the keys. And what we want to be able to do is test all the keys or tens of thousands of keys against this, the lock to see which fit and which may activate the mechanism. So that's basically virtual screening. Um, earlier this year, our computational chemists um, came to us with a request that they wanted to carry out a very large virtual screen of between five and 25 million compounds against a, a common target that's been identified in a number of cancer-related pathways. So at first, it, it seemed Fairly reasonable, we thought we could, we could handle this. We did something similar a couple of years before, but on a, a, probably a magnitude less. Um, but then they started talking about wanting to change up the model. So rather than using a static target, they actually wanted to use a flexible target, which you'll see here with the protein actually moving. So imagine trying to fit tens of thousands into keys, or tens of thousands of keys into locks, and the locks con continually moving. And you're trying to figure out which fit best. So that was the problem we had. So we started doing a few back of the envelope calculations and we realized that in order to dock around 10 million molecules in under a week, we'd need sustained access to about 50,000 cores, which was a bit of a problem as we didn't have 50,000 cores out of $30 million, actually $40 million, to build out that capacity internally. In addition to that, our internal clusters were 100% utilized. Um, we averaged about 80% utilization across the board. And year after year, um, these are our job pending times. Our job pending times are actually go, going completely through the roof. Um, so once again, we've we reached, reached out to Cycle Computing, AWS, and Molsoft to see if they could help us design a system that could handle such a load. So we first started by benchmarking the various AWS instances um, to see which would give us the best scientific ROI. Um, as you can see from the table, uh, the CC2 extra large, or 8x large, was a pretty clear winner in terms of cost performance and we're using spot instances. Um, I mean, it's funny, I've seen a couple of these tables already th this week, um, and it really highlights that you know, you, you may, we can't always tune the application. You know, we don't have access to the code of many of these applications, but with the number of instances, the type of processes available now in the cloud, we're getting pretty close to be able to match the right infrastructure to the, to the, the application so we can get you know, pretty decent optimization is so important. I'm actually just going to skip through those. Yeah. So how did the experiment go? Um, so these, these are the results. Basically working with the cycle folks, we created a cluster of about 90,000 cores. Um, and they actually created that in under two hours. Uh, then we started a docking run. So we actually docked about 10 million compounds in nine hours. So basically we've done 39 years of computational chemistry in 11 hours. Um, and probably one of the biggest factors here, um, all for a cost of about $4,000. So it did, like I said, basically 39 years of computational chemistry for about $4,000. And probably the, the most important thing to come out of this, we actually found a number of promising candidates, so possible targets um, to go off and uh, investigate cool. further. So it really was a, it was a really exciting project. Um, and this is actually becoming pretty commonplace now. We have a number of groups who want to run this on a regular basis. So what did we learn? Um, one of the big things, and we, you know, we get this a lot from, from Jason Stowe over at Cycle as well, is, is ask your users, what would you like to do? How creative could you be if you had unlimited resources? Could you design an experiment that will take, take advantage of this? Uh, but also quickly follow that up with, 
Make sure before you unleash them on the, on the, the environment to tune and benchmark every instance where possible. Um, we can easily run into a simulation which could cost tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars pretty quickly. Um, and it's, you know, that's not too far-fetched when we see where the science is going. Um, if we look at the future plans down at the bottom there, um, we are actually looking at docking compounds in the billions of compounds now. Um, next generation sequencing, we're doing data processing of petabytes of data. Uh, every, actually, every couple of months, we're, we're ripping through a few hundred terabytes of data. Um, probably one of the most disruptive technologies that we've seen in life sciences for a number of years. It's very brief at the bottom there. It's a technique known as live cell imaging, which has the potential to produce tens of petabytes every year. So rather than analyzing static images, we're now analyzing video, right? video rendering, so very similar, um, but very, very high resolution. Um, and really, that's, that's going to be one of our biggest challenges going forward, and we see this quite a lot in terms of it's quite troubling, so we've got these data, we're processing the data, we're trying to analyze the data. But what's happening, the technology is advancing so quickly, the applications are not keeping, keeping up. Um, so I think in order to, to keep up with this, application development, application licensing models really have to change dramatically if we are to take advantage of the scale available in the cloud. And actually, the, the new features in the chipsets um, you know, such as uh, Turbo Boost, which I think we hit on the Sandy Bridge processor. Sorry, that was a, the CC2. Um, direct Connect IO, uh, and especially the encryption. Um, these are absolutely going to be essential if we're to drive and make utility supercomputing uh, and, you know, an everyday, everyday task. And that's it. That's it. Thank Great. you. Thank, Thank you, Steve. You. Oh, cheers. Good seeing Thanks. you. Thanks. 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 Okay, so we talked about uh, some case studies on agility and, and uh, efficiency. Now I want to talk a little bit about reliability and security. But um, the, the first example I've got is actually one that kind of crosses over on efficiency and security. So there are a number of you that um, have secure front ends, are doing things with OpenSSL, maybe doing things with a tremendous amount of encryption. And I'll get into an example of that in just a second. Um, but one of the analyses that we did is we started to look at, hey, you know, if we were to benchmark different instances to go support uh, uh, open SSL transactions, what might be the, the best type of instance? And so what we looked at were two different instances, an M1 extra large and an M3 extra large. The difference is, is that the M3 extra large supports some new instructions that we have for encryption called AESNI or AES new instructions. Um, abbreviated. And what we found is that using those instructions, you got a 3.4x speed up on OpenSSL performance. And so we went for just a, you know, as a benchmark, 400 megabit per second on, on OpenSSL performance. And based off of that, you actually only needed to use one uh, M3 extra large. And in this particular example, we actually threw a second one on just so you could have a redundant machine for a failover or for backup. But performance-wise, you actually didn't actually need it. But you'd need 3.4 of the uh, M1 extra larges to go deliver the same level of performance. And obviously, you can't buy a 0.4 yet of a M1 extra large. You have to pay for the fourth one. And you can see the difference in cost and, and basically whether you needed to have that level of second machine for redundancy or not, um, you can see that the savings is between 50 to 75 percent. So one of the things, again, in looking at the instance, and this also translates into things as you look at trying to make your instances more secure, understanding the underlying hardware I think is going to continue to become more and more important in choosing of the instance and making sure you're deploying on the right level of security and infrastructure. Um, in the interest of time, uh, uh, Jason Timmies, who's here today, just Jason will throw up his hand. Um, if you're interested in learning more about uh, NASDAQ, feel free to come uh, talk to him at the end of the day. But obviously, I, I think everyone here in the room knows uh, NASDAQ. It's a very familiar uh, name, um, one of the largest exchanges in the world. Th uh, th uh, 3,300 companies, $6 trillion, that's a lot. I was trying to do the math in my head about what the average market cap then is of a company on the NASDAQ. But when you think about mission critical applications, it doesn't get much more mission critical than the, the NASDAQ. And they obviously have a very strong record and a reliable record, which is why so many companies list with them. And at the heart of that 
is obviously the, the reliability and the security and the trust with the data that they have. There's also, as you uh, may know, a tremendous amount of financial and securities regulation around the world that they have to be able to comply with. Now, they offer a platform called FinCloud, and it is a cloud services platform for a number of financial services companies. And within that platform, they offer something called R3, which actually runs in, in S3 um, on Amazon, which is a regulatory record retention mechanism. And so you might ask, well, if, if you know, Amazon can run uh, R3 and FinCloud, you know, how is it that NASDAQ manages security? And, and obviously, that might mean that uh, from my standpoint or what I might need to do in the, do in the cloud, obviously, uh, there are certain things I can do to make sure that it's secure. So there are four elements that uh, Jason shared with me in terms of what they do from best practices in ensuring security in the cloud. The first one is having a mechanism for data classification. And you can see that actually on the right-hand side. There's public, internal, confidential, and highly confidential, all of which happen to be approved for cloud, but my understanding is that in the um, highly confidential case, they actually just flag it for review. So if someone makes a decision whether or not the data should reside in the cloud. Then once the data that's at rest within R3 is in, say, AWS, they use AES-256 and encrypt everything there. They hold on to the, uh, uh, the keys themselves uh, within, within NASDAQ, and those are encrypted uh, as well. And then they make sure that everything is audited. And I, I was, um, <clears throat> I didn't, uh, probably didn't mention this, but you know, uh, R3 being it's a financial records database is not supposed to be updated. It's, it's a read-only database or a read-many database, but you're basically supposed to write once and then not alter the transactions for obviously very good reasons. But they also want to make sure that they know who has access <clears throat> to the database itself, and that's also how they leverage a lot of the security features within AWS. So they have um, uh, uh, identity uh, management services that they use within uh, AWS. They do multi-factor authentication, virtual private cloud to allow separation of those um, private networks, and so really allowing AWS to become sort of that centerpiece in managing the permissions and access to it, but they do encrypt everything, and they do a very good job of making sure that they're very conscious about what does reside in the cloud, and then when it does, it's all encrypted. So those are some of the best practices that NASDAQ is doing from a security standpoint. So now I'd ask the question, what's next? And I told you I'd give you a sense into a little bit about where we are going based off of the examples and how we can make things uh, more efficient, more scalable, um, and uh, more reliable in the cloud. And I'll talk about three things here. First is what we're doing from a product and a technology perspective. Second, how the underlying building block is going to change. And I think it's going to fundamentally change the way in which Amazon and others can deliver cloud services to you. And then the last is how we make software-defined infrastructure a reality. So we saw this earlier, and what we're pleased to uh, highlight is that there are two new instances that were just uh, announced. Um, these are both based off of our latest generation Ivy Bridge processor, and we're very pleased that uh, for those new instances that Amazon chose the, the product. But again, you can look and see that they are high levels of, of compute and taking advantage of the higher frequencies that we're delivering in the product, more cores and larger cache sizes, up to 20 megabytes uh, uh, in the product. And again, this is continuing to offer more spectrum and more capability um, in the, the product offering. Now, the other element to helping with efficiency, um, we sat down with, with Amazon and said, you know, it seems like there are a number of people that spin up instances just to look at the CPU type. And with things like AES and I, or we just talked about Turbo as well, uh, you want to know what you're ultimately paying for at the end of the day. There may be things that you would expose or things that will help you test and to benchmark the differences in those. Why not make it transparent? And so, you know, this was a first that we did um, with Amazon. We announced kind of an Intel inside the cloud type of thing so that you would know when Intel technology was being used in an instance. And I believe that on 16 of the 17 instances, we currently have that Intel inside brand. But the other thing is that when you go to the website now and you look at the instances, you get much more clarity and transparency about what processors, what frequency, does it have AES and I, which those again are the, the uh, crypto acceleration um, 
instructions that I just mentioned, or advanced vector instructions for supercomputing types of applications, allowing you to do more HPC or parallel computing types of applications, or turbo, or other types of things. We want, as we deliver that technology, there's no reason it shouldn't be transparent to you. So I'm very pl proud that we're able to announce this as a first with Amazon. Um, Another thing, this is sort of our second generation doing this, and I don't know, Gary, I'm going to ask you, has the official result been published yet, or it's still, uh, still for not till supercomputing? So I think this week is the International Supercomputing Conference, and um, I remember last time Amazon came to us and said, hey, we want to go do a supercomputing run, and we worked on delivering uh, one of the, the best supercomputers in the world, and, and that's the reality of when you have the scale like Amazon does, they can do pretty amazing things. So. Um, stay tuned, we'll see how the list gets published. It's still pending uh, publication, but using 26,000 of these new Ivy Bridge latest generation fastest processors that we have, they're able to deliver 484 teraflops. And my prediction, this is just a prediction, is it'll be one of the top 60-ish uh, uh, supercomputers in the world, and that is pretty fantastic in terms of offering that capability to companies that want to do bioscience research or that want to go render something in the cloud. This is a, a, a truly a remarkable feat. So we're very excited to be working with them on the latest technology. Now the other thing which I'll tell you on, and again, I'd like to throw a few futures out there. We're working on a product that some of you may be aware of called, uh, it's abbreviated MIC, standing for Many Integrated Core. Um, it's the, uh, the Xeon Phi family is the brand for that. And we're going to be coming to production with that product over 50 cores, very high performance, targeted for these scientific applications. And if you're impressed with this result, I think you're going to see uh, something that's even more revolutionary when we come out with, with that technology. So we're very excited to be working closely with Amazon in the supercomputing realm. So I talked about the fundamental ingredients that we think are going to add more capability and breadth into the product lines that Amazon can bring to, to market. But the underlying infrastructure, and you may never care about this, you may never see about it, but hopefully some of you that are geeky like me might care. Um, uh, but we're actually changing the way that the fundamental infrastructure is going to be put together. And that today, the way that things are deployed is we work with an OEM, and the OEM provides a box, and that box then gets sliced up into some number of virtual machines, which become instances for you. The way in which we want to deliver infrastructure in the future is actually that the racks that are delivered by OEMs like HP, Dell, Amazon, other, I mean, uh, uh, ZT, others out there in the industry, they're actually going to be a single integrated rack. And that rack will contain everything from both Xeons and Atom SOCs so that they can mix and match different types of instances. It'll be connected by a switch fabric. It'll use silicon photonics technology, so actually light uh, uh, fiber versus uh, copper. And it'll actually disaggregate the storage. And the net result of this is instead of having a system that gets sliced up, It'll actually allow Amazon and others to create their own systems based off of the infrastructure. So a much more flexible infrastructure that hopefully will allow for you to be able to create your own systems that are ideally suited to the type of compute, network, storage, and memory that you would uh, allocate. So we'd like to have this infrastructure be more agile, more efficient, and reliable at the end of the day. So this is actually a bit of that vision. And you know, when we talk about software-defined infrastructure, we think about the way in which someone can create a cloud service that allows the workload, your workload, to define the ideal machine so you use exactly and only what you actually need to be able to use. Amazon, at the top of the stack, is going to own that infrastructure, but it's our job to help make sure that all the program, all the platforms, all of the architecture, and, and another layer that you see in there called Service Assurance Manager, that we're providing the instrumentation and the telemetry to make that happen. So we want to have platforms that are based on Intel architecture and in compute, in servers, in network, and in storage. We want to be able to have that rack scale architecture that I just showed you be the way in which you can create pools of CPU, memory, and I.O and then allow the instrumentation to provide much more fine-grained resolution than you currently have today. So this is where we're going. We're not there yet, but uh, give us a couple of years, and you'll see some exciting changes, I think. So I want to just kind of summarize and uh, wrap up here. We talked about the three key elements, and we highlighted some, some case studies. 
from an agility standpoint, is going to continue to be crucial, especially as we layer on all these uh, new requirements for gesture recognition, for pervasive computing, for uh, big data. All of the things are going to drive even more scale, and having the ability to have more flexibility in infrastructure is key. I think we talked about the best practices being help to make sure that each of your instances is disaggregated so that they're single instance that allows you more flexibility and scale, but also making sure that you use what you need and you plan for those and have the right test and dev development uh, uh, environments. From an efficiency standpoint, it's about finding the right instance for your particular application. Amazon does a great job of offering the broadest portfolio in the industry, and they're providing you more tools um, to be able to analyze what the actual usage is for those, take advantage of those to size it right. And then I also think that Steve's approach to benchmarking and really looking at the true cost of those instances is key. And then, of course, wherever possible, if you can reserve instances, that'll save additional money and efficiency. And then from a reliability standpoint, it really comes down to how can you add security, how can you develop the right policies, take a page from the, the NASDAQ playbook and how you apply it, but also look for some of the underlying features in the platforms and in the infrastructure. And we're working with Amazon not just to roll out AES and I, but additional security features that you can take advantage of. I want to thank you very much. We're very pleased to be here in support of Amazon, and uh, we look forward to working with you. Thanks. <laughs>